What's good, everybody? Listen, the revolution is officially underway. Today, we begin our new teaching series entitled Excuseless. Today's message was very simple, very direct message for somebody that's dealing with insecurities, worried about doubts and fears. It's simply entitled, You Are Enough. It is critical for you to begin the journey of excuseless living. So do me a favor, do not watch this by yourself. I need you to watch it as a group, as a couple with somebody you love. And I need you to pay close attention to the details. And remember, you are enough. Amen, amen. I want to invite you to stand to your feet uh, if you're not tired yet. Y'all, y'all too tired to stand one last time? Amen. Friends of mine, we're going to begin a journey today. And this message is, in some ways, what you would refer to as a bridge sermon. Because we are not going to complete it all today. This is simply a connector to some larger ideas and thoughts that God has given me to share with you over the next coming months. And I just feel compelled to just really say from the onset, because there's somebody today that is spending too much time looking at what you have or don't have. You spend too much time looking at what didn't break your way. You spend too much time looking at who wasn't there for you. And you will focus so much on who wasn't there for you that you'll miss who is there for you. And, and really the large idea to somebody, I need you to realize this simple truth, that the only thing that can defeat you are your excuses. It is the stories you tell yourself for why I'm not growing, why I'm not prospering, why I'm not spiritual, why I just can't be nice to other people. I need you to know the only thing that can defeat you are the lies you tell yourself. And over these next couple of months, we want to begin a journey of canceling every excuse that's going to smother your soul, wellness, and joy. And if you're going to join this journey with me, let me hear you say amen today. Amen. I do want to acknowledge our missions director for our conference and his lovely wife, Puck and Jennifer Fordham are in the house. Let's give them a hearty amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. So as we get into it today, I want to begin, and I want us to make a declaration. I'm kind of big into that. I like it. I think it cements us, allows us to speak on one accord. There is an excuseless covenant that I want us to declare with one another before we get into our scripture today. I'm going to ask for our media team to put that on the screen. And I want us to say it together as a group. And I need you to know that this is not just words we are muttering into the air. This is a spiritual covenant that we are making with God and with one another. And so let's say it together as a church. Today, I begin the journey toward excuseless living. I recognize that excuses are kryptonite to my soul and cancer to my calling. I make a covenant to stop lying to myself about why I pray so little, fail so often, procrastinate so frequently, neglect my health, live without structure, and leave family outcomes up to chance. I will add focus to essential things and withdraw focus from optional things. I will focus less on what I'm lacking and stand in the promises of God's supply. I will reclaim my time, budget my energy, and withhold oxygen from all excuses. This is the season. The time is now. I feel my help. Let the revolution begin. I claim God's power to become excuseless. Give your neighbor a little dap. Say, become excuseless. Give somebody else dap. Say, join the revolution. Amen, amen. Remain standing as we go quickly to the word, Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, and we're going to look together at verse 23. Exodus chapter 2. And verse 23, when you get there, let me hear you say amen. Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23. Again, we're going to continue tomorrow morning online all throughout the week, and then we'll be here in person Wednesday night as we continue this series, even on Wednesdays as well. 
Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23. When you get there, say, Pastor, I'm there. And my goal is not to be too long today. I say it too long. I didn't say it wouldn't be long. It's not too long. Amen. The Bible says, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And the Bible says, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and acknowledged him. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not what? The bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take off, your, take off your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Today, saints, for just a little while, with God's help, I want to talk to you under the subject, you're enough. You're enough. Let's pray. Father, would you sermonically perform the miracle of the fishes and the loaves? Lord, would you take the little that I have and the little that I am, and would you multiply it that it might be sufficient for all of those who hear. My prayer today, Lord, is that faith will be multiplied exponentially in the hearing of the word. And Father, my prayer at the end of the day is that you would hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and that Jesus alone would be praised. Let your spirit settle upon this service, we pray, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Let those who believe shout together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord today. <clears throat> Again, talking on the subject, you are enough. You know, as a child, uh, as a small child of the 80s, my favorite superhero character was the Superman played by Christopher Reeve. Superman was faster than a speeding bullet. He was more powerful than a steaming locomotive. He was able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. 
And if you remember, Superman could not be hurt by bullets, knives, explosions, or fires. Essentially, no weapon formed against him could prosper. The only thing that could hurt Superman is if his uh, enemy, Lex Luthor, was able to get his hands on some kryptonite. And you remember kryptonite was a metal from Superman's home country that traveled with him to Earth. And when he was exposed to kryptonite in Earth's atmosphere, it would weaken him and take away all of his superpowers. Now, the strange thing is that Superman was the carrier of kryptonite. He transported the only thing that was able to weaken him. And the truth is, friends, that each of us has a kryptonite that is tailored to our fallen nature. And what somebody needs to know is that your kryptonite is not circumstantial. It is not financial. It is not relational because no weapon formed against you can prosper. In fact, your kryptonite is not the things that went well or went bad. It is not about the breaks that did not go your way, for all things work together for good. To them who love God and are called according to his purpose, I need you to know the only kryptonite that can weaken you are the excuses that you make for not growing and progressing and prospering in the Lord. In fact, church, the the only thing that can defeat you are the lies that you tell yourself. Like Superman, we are the carriers of our kryptonite. We are the transporters of that which can weaken us. In other words, church, your kryptonite sounds like this, I don't have time. Your kryptonite sounds like this, if I had more money. Your kryptonite sounds like this, if I only married them. Your kryptonite is when you look more at your circumstances and more at your situations than you look at the God that is able to do all things well. And friends, what I'm inviting you to do over these next few weeks is take a journey with me as we cancel all of the excuses that are smothering our soul wellness and keeping us from becoming who God has ordained us to be. But the thing I I remember about Superman, if you recall, whenever he was weakened by kryptonite, if he could just get away from the kryptonite and fly up beyond the atmosphere and get in the presence of the sun, you realize that he would be rejuvenated by the sun. He would be revived by the sun. He would be made strong again by the S-U-N sun. And how many of us know that when you're touched by the kryptonite, tonight of your own making if you can just get in the presence of the S-O-N that you can be revived by the Son Jesus Christ you can be revived in the Son you can be restored in the Son that you can be strengthened by the power of the Son of God can the church say amen and so friends as we go quickly back to the word I need you to know that the story of Moses is very instructive for us as we begin this journey one with another because what you're going to notice is that Moses does not jump at the opportunity to be used by God in fact he offers a variety of excuses as to why God should choose someone else and and over the course of the next few weeks, we will see how God helps him to manage his excuses. But today, as we look at this text, the first thing it teaches us is that your circumstance won't destroy you. It's going to develop you. Now, now let me say it again for somebody's hearing. That, that whatever you're going through is not going to destroy you. What you're in is going to develop you. 
Moses, if you recall, church, is a fugitive from the land of Egypt. The last 40 years of his life have been spent adjusting to the rural climate in the land of Midian. He has developed a whole new life that has no remnants of his former life. And he spends his days leading large flocks of sheep through rocky and desert terrain. And this day, as Moses leads the flock behind the backside of the desert, God uses a particular spectacle to capture the attention of Moses. The Bible says that Moses sees a burning bush. Now, understand that at first glance, this is no big deal because in an arid desert climate, it's very common to see bushes that are on fire fire. So initially Moses doesn't pay it any mind. He doesn't give it any intellectual recognition. He assumes that in about 30 seconds that bush will be completely consumed. But man, maybe Moses has this spatial awareness. Maybe he can sense it in his peripheral vision that after a minute the bush is still burning. After three minutes, the bush is still burning. After seven minutes, the bush is still burning. After 20 minutes, the bush is still burning. After 30 minutes, the bush is still burning. And after all this time, he feels heat or from the flames. He can hear the crackling sound of the brush. And eventually, Moses has to turn around and see why this bush is burning, but it is not consumed. And notice, church, that God draws his attention to this spectacle. You see, before he speaks from the bush, he allows Moses to observe the bush. Before he teaches from the bush, he allows him to analyze the bush. Before he gives a call from the bush, he begins to captivate the attention of Moses from the bush because understand that there is something powerful in the bush because the bush is surviving an atmosphere that should destroy it. Okay. The bush is thriving in a space that ought to overwhelm it. And understand, friends, that the bush does not die in the fire. The bush thrives in the fire. Okay, y'all didn't get it. The, the bush is not feeding the fire. The bush is being fed by the fire. The bush is not being weakened by the fire. The bush is being strengthened by the fire. And understand that before Moses is a powerful role play of character development because the fire does not destroy the bush. The fire is simply developing the bush. And before God gives voice from the bush, he is forecasting to Moses and all that walk by faith, the experience of how he grows us. You see, God is not trying to sow Moses a bush in the fire. He's trying to show Moses himself in the fire. And the same way God would keep the bush from being consumed is the same way he would sustain us when ever life got hot around us. And see, this is the truth today, church. How many of us recognize that God makes great men and women in the fire? Oh God, y'all mad today. He, he doesn't grow us in air conditioning. He doesn't grow men and women on the beach. The word says that he grows great people in the fire. And see, this is epic because at times our purposes are at odds with God because we want with all power to get away from the discomfort of the fire when God wants to use your discomfort to develop your character. And the reason there are times we nullify our call with excuses is because we see the fire as a place of destruction. But how many of us know that fire is a place of development? 
And, and it's crazy because at the beginning, Moses essentially steps back from this assignment because he can anticipate how hot and uncomfortable this assignment will be. But God does not give voice to any of his excuses because God is trying to say to Moses, the same way I keep the bush in the fire is the same way I'll keep you when you go through seasons of testing. Now, now, now church, this parable would have made sense if God showed him some clay in the fire. It would have made sense if he saw some metal in the fire. It would have made sense if he saw some iron in the fire because those things have properties that are able to withstand the presence of some heat. But God adds the tension on purpose when he allows him to see a living object surviving the fire. In other words, it is a foreshadowing of a larger truth that the same way that plant survived a space that should have killed it is the same way God keeps us in conditions that ought to take us out. Can I pause to say to somebody, don't let your circumstance dictate your belief about your survival. Oh, y'all not hearing me today. See, has anybody ever been in that place where on the front end of the trial, you didn't think you were going to make it through? When that trial first started, all you could see is your collapse. All you could see is your demise. All you could see is yourself going under. But you didn't realize that you were a burning bush that was under tailored heat by God that was not going to overwhelm you it was simply going to develop you. Do I have any burning bushes that can testify you didn't think you would make it through your child's crisis? You didn't think you would make it through that divorce? You didn't think you would survive the loss of that loved one? You thought that that financial season was going to take you out, but the same way that that bush continued to thrive in the fire, you realize that before God spoke from the bush. The bush was already talking to Moses. In other words, the bush is saying to Moses, it's hot in here, but I'm still here. It's burning, but I'm still here. Moses, it's uncomfortable, but I'm still here. And I need some burning bushes to give God a still here kind of praise because after all you've been through, You can say, I'm still here by the grace and power of the Almighty God. Oh, y'all not hearing me today? In other words, after the surgery, you're still here. After the chemo, you're still here. After the grief, you're still here. After the divorce, you're still here. After the miscarriage, you're still here. After they talked about you, you're still here. And some of us are complaining because we're not there but you can't get there if you're not still here and you ought to just give God a praise that you're still here by the grace and power of God are y'all hearing me today friends And so the word says to us here in Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 7, the Bible says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. You see, the second thing this story teaches us, church, is that God already has a plan in place. Okay. You see, the children of Israel have been in bondage for about 400 years, and God says, I have seen enough. But there is something in the timeline that is noteworthy for the development of our faith. Y'all remember reading there in chapter 2 and verse 23 that when Moses first left to go to Midian, that the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Bible says that the Lord heard them 
and he acknowledged them. Did y'all catch that? Now, the Bible says that he heard them the time where Moses left, but there was 40 years between the time he heard the prayer and the time he answered the prayer. How many of us know that sometimes the same day God hears is not the same day that God acts? Mm. No, 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 the same day he hears it is not the same day he acts on it. And the reason that's important is because some of us are frustrated and we have a diminishing faith because we're operating under the assumption that if God heard us, then things would be better by now. If God heard me, things would already have changed by this season. But how many of us know that God can hear in one season but not move until the next season? And see, this is important, church, because sometimes we put too much confidence in a particular outcome. But the Bible in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14 says, this is the confidence that we have, that whatsoever we ask in his name, we know that he hears us. See, how many of us know you got to get to a place where your confidence is not in outcomes. You have confidence to know that whenever you pray, there is no prayer that escapes the ear of God. And see, if God hears me, I just need to have trust to know that God will deliver me in his time. And I love somebody put it online this week, Lewis Jones. See, sometimes we'll miss the when, worried about the when. Okay. We'll miss the W-I-N, the victory, because we're so distracted about when it's going to come to pass. But how many of us know that you've got to get to a place where you have the type of faith that leaves the when and the timing up to God? See, we get frustrated about the win, and that's why we pray with a, with a desperation that is not always necessary. Does not Jesus say in Matthew chapter 6 that your father knows what things you need even before you ask of them? See, I need somebody to get this larger truth. I need you to know God knows what you need. It's already on his schedule. And I need you to know that even when you pray, you're not informing God of what you need. You're just giving him permission to act on your behalf. And, and see, there's a larger truth because some of us have got to get to the place where we just stop praying on the level of survival. No, no, you got to start praying on the level of abundance and supernatural. Why am I saying stop praying on the level of survival? How many of us know that 80% of the things we pray for are things that God was going to do even if you never prayed? Oh, God. Did not Jesus say, don't worry about your life and what you're going to eat and where you're going to live and about your body. He says, man, your father knows what things you have need of. In other words, even if you didn't pray about basic necessities, God was still going to come through simply because he is your father in heaven. Oh, see, some of y'all still don't believe that. See, how many parents are in the house today? Any parents in the room? Like, how many of us can tell the truth that if your kids never said, I'm hungry, you still gonna feed them? Oh, y'all acting brand new. If they never asked for school clothes, you still gonna buy them. If they never said nothing, you still gonna pay tuition. Even if they never asked, you still gonna get them something for Christmas, even when they act like baby kids. Am I telling the truth today? I mean, you still go get them something for Christmas. Why? Because it's not based upon their asking. It's because of how much you love them. And whether they ask or not, you're going to provide all of their needs. And we serve a God that's so great that says, but even if you don't ask, I'm going to bless you. And I'm not saying that you don't ask. I'm just saying you ought to ask bigger than survival. Are y'all hearing the word today, church? Now, it's funny because some of us are listening to this thing and saying, well, well, Pastor, man, I'm still upset that God hears in one season, but he doesn't answer for 40 years later. But, but see, one of the things I'm learning, church, is that sometimes God 
has to let the fruit get ripe. See, in this time of waiting, not only does God prepare a deliverer, he prepares the people to be delivered. Okay. See, 40 years earlier, deliverance would have been convenient, but God had to let it get to a place where it was critical. In other words, the way God prepared the people is he had to let the oppression run its course. He had to allow their disgust to mount. He had to allow their frustration to swell. He had to allow their discontent with Egypt to run its full course before he showed up to deliver them. Why, pastor, did God have to let it get that bad to deliver them? Well, think about it with me, church. What was their solution in the wilderness whenever it got hard? If their solution after the 40 years was to go back to Egypt, if God had showed up a moment earlier, they wouldn't have even walked out of the door. And so God had to let it get so bad and so desperate and so hard that they would finally walk through the door that God opened. And see, there are some of us that are praying for deliverance from some things. Some are praying for deliverance from a habit. Some are praying for deliverance from some soul ties. Some of us are praying for deliverance from a situation. But see, some of us don't recognize that though we hate the consequences, there's still a familiarity and a comfort there. And sometimes God has to allow that predicament to get so uncomfortable and so unmanageable manageable and so unlivable that you actually walk out of the door when God opens it. See, it's crazy because God says, I've come down to deliver them. Now, now that word in the Hebrew, anasal, is a very interesting word. It is a word to, uh, which means to catch or it means to rescue. In other words, what, what God is literally painting a picture of is him being like a midwife helping someone deliver a, preg a child. And see, how many of us understand that deliverance has to have a certain desperation to it? What do you mean? How many of us ladies can testify that after a certain period of time of being pregnant, at some point, deliverance, it's going to become involuntary. Oh, uh, once you get to a certain level of pregnancy, it's going to happen whether you want to or not, but you got to be so full and so ready and so determined that you're willing to push. Wait a ladies at today. In other words, the doctor don't deliver the baby. The doctor just catches the baby when he comes, but it is because the woman is full that there is an involuntary delivery. And what I'm saying is that when you get full of frustration and you get full of discontent and you're full of your anger, that's when there is a delivery and God says, I'm just gonna catch you and push your mission forward. Are y'all hearing me today, church? But this is the point. I want y'all to notice something. That, that while Moses is in the mountain and God is talking to him, the children of Israel are still there in bondage. The same day he's talking to Moses, they're still weeping in Egypt. But I want you to notice something. Is that even though there is no evidence of a deliverer, there is no momentum. There is no groundswell. There is no, no nothing that is suggesting that the days are going to change. Today was just like the one before that. But I need you to know that God gives Moses the plan. Notice the detail he gives him. He says, when you bring them out. Oh, God. He says, when you bring them out, you're going to bring them to this mountain and worship me. 
He says, this is what I'm going to do when Pharaoh resists and hardens his heart. He makes it clear, this are the signs that you give them when they don't believe you. He says, I've already prepared a land that is flowing with milk and honey, and they're going to drive out the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites. In other words, while they are in Egypt trying to figure it out, God is already on the outside, and he has worked that thing out. And it's crazy because God has already determined that there is an expiration date on their time in Egypt. There is an expiration date for their bondage. There is a time of completion for this cruelty that God had already set up a day where their weeping was going to end. Okay. See, how many of us know that God had already told Abraham how long the bondage was going to be? So God not only had a start time, God also had a concluding date. I need somebody in a trial to know that your trial had a start date, but it also has an expiration date that God has predetermined a season where your weeping is going to end, where your financial issues will be complete, where those marital issues will turn around. I need somebody to rejoice because this trial has an expiration date. This sickness has an expiration date. This struggle has an expiration date. And how many can rejoice that this world has an expiration date? Because he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. Thank God that trouble won't last always. And see, this is the truth, friends, because God doesn't always tell us when it's going to happen. I just have confidence that it's going to happen. And see, friends, this is why if you're going to take the journey of faith, you got to leave the wind up to God. You just got to occupy till he comes. Don't have a witness out there today. Man, man, it's kind of like this. Anybody ever order food on DoorDash? Man, it's a very fantastic app. Man, man, where where you ain't got to go and get the food. They can, you can order it and they'll deliver it to you. But man, one of the things that messes me up on DoorDash is they have this function where you can see where the driver is. And you can see where they are on their way to getting the food. You can see where they are when they're bringing the food to you. If I'm ordering here at church, they always get lost somewhere on Adventist Boulevard. Man, and I'm sitting there in my office pounding my desk because I'm mad about how long it's taking for it to get there. But now what I do is I don't sit there and watch how long it's going to take. I just hit send or accept. And I just trust that because the payment has been made, that it's going to come and it's on the way. And I just need some faith-filled believers to trust that because the payment has been made. You just need to know the blessing is on the way. I need you to know your healing is on the way. I need you to know provision is on the way. I need you to know protection is on the way. And when life gets hard, remember that Jesus is on the way to come and receive his children. Are y'all hearing the word today, friends? And then the word says here in verse number 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Third thing this teaches us, friends, simple message, just a bridge. God needs somebody to know that you are enough. See, what you're going to see in coming weeks is that Moses offers a number of excuses as to why he can't go. I mean, he lays it all out before God. He's like, man, God, I can't speak. Lord, they're not going to believe me. Man, Lord, man, I don't have the resume. Lord, I don't have an army. And guess what, man? I completely get it and I understand it. But I need you to know that all of those excuses are undergirded or summarized in that one question that Moses asked when he says, who am I that I should go? 
And what undergirds that question, friends, is this sense of unworthiness and a lack of value that suggests that I am not enough to do what God says. And see, friends, I get it because there's something about Moses that cannot believe that little old insignificant me can be called by God to do that big thing. And friends, I get it, man. I have been there more times than I care to imagine. I understand what he means. Man, I, I ain't got no army. I, I don't have the pedigree. I don't have the political clout. I don't, I don't have the, 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 the resume. I don't have the standing in order to go and tell a pharaoh anything. In other words, my, my resume is not commensurate or congruent with this particular assignment. And notice, church, help me, stay with me. Notice that Moses disqualifies himself. I need you to notice something in this dialogue. Who is the one that brings accusation? Who is the one that points out all the flaws? Who is the one that points out all of the lack? Who is the one that identifies what he is not? Who is the one that says what he cannot do? Notice that none of that rhetoric comes from the bush. It all comes from inside of Moses. And see, friends, it communicates one of the traits of the fallen nature. See, I need you to get that one of the greatest traits of the fallen nature is not just a bend towards sin. It is a bend towards self-sabotage. See, humanity, no matter how much bravado we have, man, no matter how strong our exterior, no matter how much swag in our walk, I need you to know all of us have this imposter syndrome operating inside of us, that we have this inner critic that somehow raises up in destiny moments, and it comes in the form of that same inquiry that says, Lord, who am I to do what you're calling? And so I need you to get that, that sense of I'm not what I can't do, who I'm not, what I'm lacking. I need somebody to hear me on this. It is not the work of the Holy Spirit. This said rhetoric or these refrains come from the flesh. It's funny because we will literally proffer up excuses as to why I can't grow and why I can't do this and why I can't do that. And we will fill our lives with all these reasons as to why we can't when the powerful promise of the scriptures is that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And let me just be clear when I say this, I want to say to somebody that humility, it is not humility to insult yourself, criticize yourself, demean yourself, or degrade yourself. How many of us know that humility is not an awareness of just how flawed I am? It's my awareness of how perfect he is. Humility is not me just recognizing what I'm not. Humility is the recognition that my help comes from God. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? So that guess what? I should humble myself. I should deny myself. I should submit myself. I should yield myself, but I should never degrade myself. I should never down myself. I should never hate myself. I should never sell myself short. I need somebody to know that in Christ you are enough. Are y'all hearing the word today? And see, we love to preach about the sin of self-inflation, but it's also a sin to self-deflate. See, the problem is we think our value is earned through performance. How many of us know that I have value that is inherent simply because I am a child of the Most High God? Lord, I wish somebody would wake up to the truth of this word today. I need you to stop assessing your value based upon the degrees behind your name or behind the neighborhood where you live or the type of car that you drive. How many of us know that it is not how much you get paid that brings you value? You have value because of the price that was paid in order to procure your salvation. 
So y'all don't believe me. Can I go to the Word for just a moment? I'm almost done. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. I need you to see some things in the, in the Scripture today. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. The Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image. Did y'all catch that church? I need you to know, friends of mine, see, for too many of us, this is just a theological truth that I am created in the image of God. I need you to understand that you have divine DNA inside of you. That you've got the very imprint of God that governs and guides all of the affairs of your life. I need somebody to understand that you are okay simply because you bear his resemblance. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Can we look a little further in the Word? Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Just a few things I need you to see. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Jeremiah chapter 1. And verse 5, when you get there, say, Pastor, I'm there. So the word says this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Did y'all catch what the word says? I need you to know that this does not just apply to the prophet Jeremiah. There is a larger spiritual truth for us all. The Bible lets us know that Jeremiah was formed in the womb. That he was developed by the hand of God. That he was shaped for a particular purpose and a function. Why is that critical, Brother Perry? Because most of us think we are born when the truth is you were formed. See, if I'm just born, that's just the result of biology taking its normal course. But I need you to know that your life is not just the result of sperm or fertilizing egg. I need you to know that within the science of it all, that God oversaw the very formation of your life and that God assigned purpose and God input gifts and God developed a temperament and God gave you talents and God put something in you to empower the world for his glory and see I need you to know that because you were formed you are formed for a function and see that's why you should never fear when you're confronted with your function because you are formed for that very thing so you need not live a life of intimidation or fear because you are formed to do whatever it is that God is calling you to do are y'all hearing the word today friends you were born to carry the weight. Whatever you're in, it's not too heavy. You were formed for it. It's funny, I remember a while back, uh, my wife and I were in this furniture store. And I don't know if you've ever seen in, like, in, the, in these stores, this, this outside lawn stuff. It's like these, these pods that have like a metal back that come over the back and they hang by this little string. Y'all ever seen these little pods? And so we were in the store, Principal Dent, and, 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 you know, they were saying, man, you can get these pods on sale. And they were like, Mr. Snell, you can go ahead and sit down and, and test the little pod. And I was looking at that little string that was holding it. And I ain't gonna lie, I was a little nervous about that string because I wasn't sure that string can hold all this anointing. Y'all not hearing the pastor today. And, and, and I was just like, man, I, I ain't getting in that because I ain't trying to pay for nothing in this store. I don't want no situation. And he was just like, no, go ahead and try it. It is well able to handle the weight. And Malcolm, he began to articulate that, man, the rod was uh, made of titanium for strength and another uh, uh, element for elasticity. And he says it's up, able to handle up to five or 600 pounds. I was like, I'm straight. It still looks too small in order to hold me. And he says, listen, I need you to sit in it because it would be doing us a favor because he said that because of the elastic element they need heavy people to sit in it because if it's never stretched it loses its capacity so that if it never holds anything heavy it loses its capacity because it was formed to carry heavy things can I just say to anybody that's carrying a heavy weight, 
that God saw before you were born, the load you were going to have to carry. And he gave enough strength and enough elasticity so that you can hold whatever he put in front of you. It may cause you to bend, but you're not going to break because the hand of God is going to hold you up and it's going to keep you from falling. And see, this is it, church. Because see, there are some of us that resonate with Moses. Because Moses says, who am I to do this big thing? And some of us are sitting with a bunch of excuses as to why we're not operating and calling and moving in faith and stepping outside of our comfort zone because you're asking yourself that same question. Who am I to go back to school? Who am I to stand up in front of people? Who am I to write something? Who am I to record something? Who am I to be on the dean's list? Who am I to be successfully married? It's crazy because the devil has actually used some of our past against us with such skill that some of us don't even think we deserve better. But I need you to know that if you're a child of the Most High God, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. His grace is more than sufficient. And where your sin abounds, grace does much more abound. You need not be paralyzed by what was. You need to stand in the strength of your divine calling. And see, God sent me by here today to simply communicate a simple truth to some ambivalent and fearful and anxious soul that God, it, it has you on the precipice of something great. He has you on the verge of something supernatural, but you're sitting there like Moses and saying, who am I? Who am I to lead a ministry? Who am I to make a difference? Who am I to spark a revival? I don't have enough education and I don't have enough knowledge and I came from the wrong part of town and my parents are divorced and my daddy wasn't around. See, this is the beauty of it all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God makes it very clear that, that, that not many mighty, not many noble, not many elite according to the flesh was called. But God says, man, I call the weak things of this world to confound the mighty and I call the foolish things to confound those things of the wise so that no flesh may glory in my presence. See, I need somebody to understand this. If you think you can't, you're in the perfect posture to be used by God. I need you to know that what qualifies you is actually your weakness because God's strength is made perfect in the area of our weakness. Are y'all hearing me today, church? So that God identifies your lack what you're not. And he says, I'm going to set my glory in your deficits. And the way I'm going to move you, I'm going to do it in such a way that your life is going to aim glory in my direction. And that people will be made wise unto salvation by the way God works in and through and inside of you. How many of us believe the word of God today? And listen, friends of mine, God is just wanting somebody to come out of self-loathing and self-hatred and, 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 and just self-insulting and self-sabotaging and self-limiting and, and low-thinking behavior. And I need you to realize that in Christ, you are more than enough. And see, somebody thinks, man, that their problem over there is that they're too proud and they, they're too braggadocious. See, I need you to know that sometimes, man, pride and outward bravado, that ain't nothing but insecurity turned inside out. That's just how we mask it. But God is saying, it doesn't matter what part of town you came from. It doesn't matter what area of the world you grew up in. It doesn't matter what your parental situation might have been. It doesn't matter what your last name is. It doesn't matter if you're new to the church or if you've got generations in the church. I need you to understand that in Christ, you are more than enough. So God's call to somebody today is to stop being fearful. It's to stop being afraid. 
It is to stop proffering up excuses and to allow God to fill your deficit and to allow God to make up the difference of your lack. I want you meditated on this song. And then I'm going to come back and invite us to make some corporate decisions about our walk with God. Hallelujah. It's a simple tune. Hey, hey, that message is in the books. Listen, that word helped me immensely. And my prayer is that it helped and blessed you. Listen, do me one favor. If this message, man, brought any value to your life, if it grew you spiritually, if it nourished you in any kind of way, I just need you to copy the link and send it to somebody. I need you to be a digital disciple need you to be an Apple apostle, need you to be an electronic evangelist. Whenever you have good news, you don't keep it to yourself. And I want you to make sure that you meet me same place, same time next week as we continue the journey of becoming excuseless.